What do you think of when you hear MacBook Pro? Do you think of performance, portability, features, and design at a premium price point? Or do you think instead of ports and upgradability and expandability? Well, chances are you probably lean towards the former, but what if I told you you could have both? See, tomorrow Apple's expected to announce the new MacBook Pro 2021, and we're all excited to see what they have in store for us. But frankly, I got a little bit impatient, and so I decided to build my own MacBook Pro 2021, which I have sitting right next to me. In a way, you could call this a Hackintosh or a Hackbook, but not in the traditional sense. See, most Hackintoshes are Windows machines that have been hacked to run macOS, but they have a couple core issues. First, often they have problems with software compatibility with iMessage, iCloud, software updates, anything along those lines. And then otherwise, they all run on x86-based legacy silicon, which is no longer efficiently optimized for macOS. Apple Silicon is optimized for macOS. This runs Apple Silicon. If it's not already obvious, I took hardware from a MacBook Air 2020 and I dropped it into a 15-inch Windows laptop. And I'd love to tell you all about it. Oh, and one more thing, it's got a touchscreen. In today's video, I'll be giving a full walkthrough on the features and experience of using this machine with a quick preview on the process of building it. But frankly, the whole process of building it was too long to fit into a single video. And so I'll be following up later in the week with a full deep dive on how this Frankenstein's monster came to be as it is. Even in 2012, when it was announced, the Latitude E5530 was not a machine to turn any heads. It was a big, bulky, business-style machine, but it did have an aluminum top panel, which comes in handy now for protecting all of the very, very delicate internals. I wouldn't ever call this device sexy, but it's functional, which is important to me. I wanted a machine, not only a latitude, because I like latitudes, but also a machine with a lot of internal space that could house all of the components that I needed and more. Now, granted, unfortunately, I had to Dremel out a very, very large portion of the internals in order to fit everything I built, which was probably pretty compromising for the structural integrity of the device. Needless to say, I don't want Linus to do a flex test on this keyboard deck, but it's okay for taking around the house. This laptop sports 16 gigs of RAM, a 256 gig SSD, and the Apple M1 chip which is to say it is one of the fastest 15 inch laptops that I've ever used. And it is also one of the quietest 15 inch laptops that I've ever used. The performance in this is incredible. It would run circles around the original Core i3 3210M processor that sat inside this device. Now granted, I did give up the upgradability of that chip, which hypothetically could have doubled its performance back in 2012, but that is a small sacrifice for having Apple Silicon. The display here is unfortunately going to be one of the bigger steps down because we no longer have retina and instead have this. I'm not sure if this is still flickering on camera, but if it is, I will turn it back around in a second. This display is probably more comparable to the displays that you see on MacBook Airs from 2017 and prior, which is to say it is very, very ugly. It is 1080p, supposedly, but I, I couldn't tell, frankly. The one feature that is the saving grace is the fact that it is a touchscreen. Say what you want about touchscreens on MacBook Airs, but I think it does add a, quite a bit of functionality when I easily want to reach up and touch the screen, and most importantly, when I'm using iPad apps on this MacBook Air. This generally runs iPad apps better than just about any MacBook out there because it has a touchscreen. Frankly, the core reason I built this machine and made this video is because there is a lot of interest out there on a touchscreen on a MacBook Air. And the reason why I know that is because it's one of the most popular videos on my channel. In February, I saw a video from Matt from DIY Perks that made me realize that you could have an external touchscreen display thanks to some very, very cheap off-the-shelf parts. So shout out to Matt from DIY Perks because his channel is an absolute inspiration, and if you haven't seen it already, you need to check it out. A quick note on the battery, which is the original battery from the MacBook Air, and a quick preview into the build video that I'll release later. I didn't think initially that I was going to be able to fit the MacBook battery inside this machine because frankly, the way that it's configured relative to the motherboard takes up a lot of internal space. So I nearly gave up, and then I remembered the first season of Halt and Catch Fire, where they're facing a very similar issue in building a computer. 
and ironically, they fold it over itself and work in a third dimension in order to fit it into the, the chassis. Similarly, I realized that after looking at the battery again, I could put the battery underneath the motherboard, use it as a tray for the motherboard itself, and then position them very suitably in this machine with a lot of internal space remaining. So thanks to Halt and Catch Fire for that one. In terms of battery life, this probably has comparable battery life to the original MacBook Air, with the exception that the display might consume a different amount of power, and the docking station that runs off the motherboard probably saps a lot of energy. But otherwise, they're probably pretty comparable. Frankly, unplugging it from the wall and carrying it around my house was one of the most scary but fulfilling experiences of this entire process. In terms of software and connectivity, this is all original hardware, so there's no issues with upgrading to the latest version of macOS, any compatibility with AirDrop, or any other feature from the MacBook. It's just a MacBook, which is awesome. Let's talk about the keyboard, which was one of the most difficult steps of this entire process. This full 104 key, number pad included, customizable keyboard is now connected directly to the MacBook via USB. That was not an easy endeavor, and I wanna thank Frank Adams on Instructables for sharing a method on how to do this. I had to learn how to solder, and I don't do it very well, in order to get this working, and I was so glad when it finally did. It's still a little bit spotty, but having a full functional keyboard with very tactile responsive keys and it being fully customizable is really, really cool. Laptop keyboards are one of those things that hasn't improved greatly in the last 10 years in terms of a user experience because we've been focused so much on making the keyboards thinner and smaller. But frankly, I prefer the experience of using this keyboard over the traditional MacBook keyboard. Finally, let's get to one of the most important parts of this build in serviceability and upgradability. This is a 100% user serviceable device, save for the motherboard. Now granted, I wouldn't hand this to a random friend who wasn't tech savvy and ask them to upgrade the storage, but thankfully, I have no issues doing so myself. The motherboard, unfortunately, anything soldered to the motherboard is not upgradable, but I can replace a motherboard if something goes wrong. And every other part of the machine is comp completely replaceable. Nearly 10 years later, many online retailers still sell parts for the Latitude E5530, which means that if I damage any part of this machine or this chassis, I can easily replace it pretty cheap. And the good news is, all the other parts are very, very easy to remove and replace, which is to say that they're all taped in here. A 4K or high refresh rate display, I can add it. A upgrade, upgraded SSD with a terabyte of storage, I can add it. Just about anything you can think of, as long as it's not directly on the motherboard, I can do, which is a great feature. Right now, the current configuration has a few USB ports, a couple display ports, and it's got an SD card reader, which is awesome. The crown jewel of upgradability here is in this modular port at the back of the machine where the battery used to be. Right now, I've just got USB-A ports in here, but hypothetically, I could put whatever I want back here. If I wanted to upgrade the storage, I could drop in an external SSD. I could also drop in an external battery. Really, it's, it's whatever I can think of, which I'm really excited about. Now in the future, I hope to get a little bit better at you know, the actual design of the product so then I can easily hot swap different modules to drop in, but that's going to take a little bit of time. Now let's talk about those features that I need to work on. This is far from a complete device. There's a lot of things that I can work on. If you didn't notice, I didn't talk about the trackpad and that's because this trackpad is still being designed. The original trackpad from the laptop is bad, and I haven't converted it to USB yet because frankly, I don't think it's worth the time. I've been trying to think of solutions for that, so let me know down in the comments if you have any ideas. In addition to that, it is not fit and polished the way that I want a final product to be. But that's largely because there are, there's more internal space and there's more features that I wanna add before locking it all up. I removed the cameras because frankly it was junk, so work from home is going to be a little bit more difficult just with the laptop itself, but I might be able to find a solution for that. And finally, I did not paint this device. I left it the original color because I want it to look almost like a sleeper build. There are a lot of options for painting this device that would be unique and different, but I'm not a very good painter, so maybe that's one of the things that I endeavor to learn over the future in improving this device. This is far from a complete product. It is a proof of concept. I knew theoretically it was possible to drop the internals of a MacBook Air into a larger machine and make it work, 
but practically I wasn't sure it was going to work out. And I was very surprised when it all came together as it is. There were several instances along the process where I was worried that I had broke several hundred dollars worth of equipment by plugging in the wrong cable or bridging contacts where I shouldn't have. And thankfully, those didn't happen. Which is to say, I highly, highly do not recommend this for anyone out there. Unless you are actively willing to gamble hundreds of dollars of MacBook Air and computer equipment, and you are a certified professional, then I would not recommend that you undertake this. Instead, if you are interested in participating in this process, you should go down in the comments and recommend me exactly what you think I should do with the next iteration of this device. I very much want my community to have a big part in the design and the way forward with this machine, and I'm excited to see the ideas that I see down in the comments. But before I wrap this up, I wanna just give one last quick thanks and shout out to Matt from DIY Perks, Frank Adams from Instructables, and the iFixit team, who's created a number of good guides that allowed me to take apart my MacBook Air without destroying it. That was impressive. Thank you for watching. I hope you catch any future videos in the segment here. Get subscribed if you really wanna see them, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.